Dr. Shiva, welcome to Australia. Thank you very much for your time today. I'd like to start by asking, how did you get interested in agriculture and biodiversity? Well, biodiversity is something I've grown up with. I've grown up in the Himalayan forest. I was active in uh, the Chipko movement, this wonderful movement of women coming out to hug trees. I became a volunteer. And even while I was doing a PhD in the foundations of quantum theory, every holiday I would spend in uh, the mountains learning from the women about biodiversity. My father was a forest conservator, so anyway, I had grown up in these mountains. It was the activism yeah. of the women that really became my teacher. So biodiversity is really as old as I am. It's my life. Uh, biodiversity in agriculture, it was 1984, the tragic year of 1984. The year when Punjab, the land of uh, the six, the land of the five rivers, the land of prosperous farming erupted in violence of a most severe kind and the army was sent into the Golden Temple to squash the violence, which led to further violence and then finally Indira Gandhi, our Prime Minister, was assassinated. And then there was massive killing of Sikhs all over the country. But that vicious cycle of violence really made me think of why did the Green Revolution lead to so much violence when it got a Nobel Peace Prize? What is different from the spin about the Green Revolution and the reality on the ground? It was also the year that uh, we had the disaster of Bhopal. A uh, pesticide plant in the city of Bhopal leaked. And this disaster took place very soon after Indira Gandhi's assassination. And by the end of the year, I was asking myself, why is the kind of agriculture we do so full of violence at every level, pesticides that kill, um, stories of prosperity that eventually lead to debt, and then farmers take to guns. So I did a study. I was then uh, working on a massive project for the United Nations University. And I told them I want to look at what are at the root of these conflicts in Punjab and did the book called The Violence of the Green Revolution and decided then to dedicate my life to promoting a nonviolent farming but understand agriculture in the process. But the seed became my life, 87. I was invited to a meeting in Geneva and Bourget on the new biotechnologies. The meeting was called Laws of Life. The UN people were there, industry was there, the old chemical industry now morphing into the new biotechnology industry. And they were saying, we have to use the tools of genetic engineering because we aren't making enough money from the chemicals. And these tools of genetic engineering will allow us to claim in the larger world that we are inventors of the seed. We can take patents by adding a new gene. and." Uh, we will have to implement laws of patenting all over the world and therefore we need a free trade agreement, the WTO, trade related intellectual property rights. And that meeting first sent a shiver down my spine because it was a vision of total control. And uh, by the time I got back home, I decided this is all I'll do, save seats. And I took a lot of inspiration while thinking how do you deal with that kind of absolute power. Uh, I got a lot of inspiration from Gandhi, from the spinning wheel that you can begin at a small level. So I call seed my spinning wheel. And the satyagraha, the resistance to unjust and brute laws, patent laws in my view are perfect candidates for not obeying because seed is not an invention. Every patent on life is a lie. And uh, so the seed satyagraha and the force of truth. This is what I've done for the last 30 years. Can you explain how chemical companies evolved after World War II from their role of building munitions to becoming agricultural supply companies? So human beings have done farming 10,000 years. And yet, after the war, that entire history, knowledge, wisdom of farming was erased because a handful of companies who had evolved the tools of chemical warfare during the war years uh, retooled these chemicals into agrochemicals. If you look at chemical fertilizers, 
they are made by the same process and in the same factories that made the explosives. The pesticides are really offshoots of the poison gases and the nerve gases. The poison gases that you were used in the war, nerve gases that were used in the concentration camps. And later the herbicides, Agent Orange, used in the Vietnam War. So all of the chemicals in agriculture that are made to look like they were innovations for agriculture really have their roots in war. But it totally reoriented the agriculture paradigm. And the power of these companies is so clear in the fact that the entire curriculum is based on what they sell. So when I was trying to understand what went wrong with the Green Revolution, and I read every textbook that people learn from to do agriculture, every insect is an enemy to be exterminated. Every bit of biodiversity is a weed that must be destroyed with a herbicide. The soil is an empty, inert container for pouring chemical fertilizers into. Though the life of the soil was taken away, the amazing biodiversity of insects, including our pollinators, including the friendly insects like the ladybird beetles and the spiders, were all turned into enemies and killed. So we have a bigger pest problem today than before. And of course, the issue of weeds uh, in, in my view, what's happening with Roundup resistant crops is really an ecocide where you're destroying biodiversity in the name of increasing food production, but what you're growing is not food. And I remember an uh, interaction during the Convention on Biological Diversity in which I played a big role, which is the uh, International UN Treaty for S Protection of Species Diversity. A Monsanto representative actually said that Roundup ready crops where you've made the seed resistant to the Roundup so you can spray more Roundup and kill more diversity, they said it prevents the weeds from stealing the sunshine. Now that's the cosmology. The post-war green revolution was intended to feed the world but how would you describe what's happened since? Well the green revolution was meant to feed the world in the same way that the GMOs today are meant to feed the world. A lot of spin. It was after all the same companies that were seeking to introduce chemicals into agriculture of countries that had just become independent. We became independent in 47. By 52 projects were already there run by the Rockefeller Foundation wanting to introduce chemicals into Indian farming except that the native seeds uh, responded in such a way that they distributed the uptake fully in the plant and there was more lodging because we evolved our seeds for multi-purpose, multifunctional agriculture. We ate the grains, the animals ate the straw, some of it went back to the soil, some of it you needed to thatch your roof. The dwarf varieties had no straw. The hard stalks couldn't be fed to animals. You couldn't compost it, you couldn't make a roof of it, it leaked. So they changed the plant. That is what Norman Borlaug did. He changed the plant to adapt to chemicals. It was always about selling more chemicals, never about feeding the world. And when Borlaug talks about, you know, the need for synthetic fertilizers, saying if I was an MP in your parliament, I'd keep jumping up every five minutes saying, we need more fertilizers, give us more fertilizers, give us more fertilizers. Today we see what synthetic fertilizers have done. They've ruined our soils, they've created dead zones in the oceans, big contributor to climate change 300 times, more damaging the nitrogen oxide. And meantime, we've lost our diversity because when you shift an internal input system into an external input system, and the seeds are designed for these external inputs. Not only do you get rid of the diversity that grew, we always grew wheat with chickpea or wheat with mustard, or always with diversity. Now you grow only wheat and only of one variety and it is nutritionally deficient to the extent now it's being rejected. People of Punjab, the rich of Punjab, go to Madhya Pradesh where the Green Revolution never came to buy the wheat of our ancient grains which has high protein, doesn't have gluten allergy. Monsanto even patented an old Indian wheat variety because it does not contribute to gluten and I had to fight that case, one of the many biopiracy cases. 
Can you explain the terms biopiracy and seed freedom? Well, biopiracy is basically the theft of biodiversity as well as in the ind indigenous knowledge related to it. Now, all of the idea of patenting seed is based on invention. Not a single seed, even genetically modified, is invented like a machine. It is based on the varieties that farmers have bred over time and contains those traits. So when a company in Texas claims to have invented the basmati, for which my valley, Dune Valley, is famous, all they did was take it and cross it. The aroma, they couldn't create it. It was in the original basmati. And uh, the elongation quality of basmati, the grain becomes longer when cooking. None of this was their invention. So they basically pirate, either from nature, if it's a wild variety, or from farmers and centuries of breeding and claim it to be their invention. That is biopiracy. This is very different from exchange. Seed has traveled the world. Seed has been exchanged freely. If I give you seed, I don't have less seed. Because I have my seed, you have your seed. And both can multiply manifold to the extent that in the millets they multiply a million which is why the millets are called millets derived from a million but if you steal my seed and then take a patent and through the patent forbid me from having my seed because a patent is a right to exclude everyone else other than the patent holder from making using selling the patented product you now have an exclusive right and you prevent everyone else from having that seed and you make it a crime for the original donor to save seed, that is the obnoxiousness of this entire intellectual property rights system. And biopiracy is intrinsic to it. What are the main steps that have led to the loss of biodiversity in agriculture in the last hundred years? There are two steps which have led to the erosion of biodiversity. The first is driven by the chemical companies in the form of the Green Revolution, but the breeding in that period from the 60s to the 90s was largely public breeding, largely universities and public seed firms. 80% of the seed till then was in farmers' hands, so farmers were the first breeders, and the next was really public breeding. It led to erosion because when Punjab with its 250 crops is replaced with Green Revolution wheat in one season and Green Revolution rice in one season, all the other diversity goes. All the diversity of wheats go and the rice was never a crop grown in Punjab. So in 1995, we had a conference in Leipzig uh, on the erosion of diversity. At that point, the figure was 75%, and it was recognized in the United Nations that this was due to the Green Revolution and the monocultures of the Green Revolution. But in the 90s, you get the chemical companies entering the seed sector. And the more rapid erosion of the last 20 years is not only because they pushed the monocultures, and we've never had monocultures of the scale we have today, corn and soya everywhere. They also push monocultures of varieties because if I am a Monsanto and you are growing an open pollinated seed which you can save, I don't have a market to sell a patented seed on which I'll collect 80% royalty. So in order to ensure a monopoly for my 80% royalty seed, I must destroy the independent supply. And, and buy them up and amalgamate them into... Well, you don't buy up a farmer. Mm. You see, 80% was farmers. You criminalize the farmer. The small seed they, you buy them up or lock them into licensing arrangements, and that's exactly what happened in India. So there were three places. Farmers, seed, they're told it's primitive. If you have some money, you know, use this miracle variety. S about 30 Indian seed companies locked into licensing arrangements to only sell BT, even though they are the breeders, even though they are the ones who make the hybrid. Monsanto doesn't do any seed work. All it does is royalty collection work. And the third is the public sector just went to sleep mysteriously. The farmers' varieties disappear. 
because of this nonsense of primitive seed, seed replacement. The measure of agriculture progress is seed replacement. That's the target set for agriculture extension officers. The Indian companies can't sell the seed without the BT gene, which is what uh, allows them to collect their royalties and their cases right now in India. But because we built movements in time, I started building movements before they could put their regimes in place. They had said at that 1987 meeting, by the year 2000, all seed will be patented. All seed will be GMO. And we said never. And today, yes, there are GMO crops. But most of the crops are not GMOs. Most of the countries are not genetically engineered. Because not only did we build the movements, we created the laws. The United Nations framework on biosafety did a lot to prevent this rushing in. So the next thing they did was to start making seed laws to criminalize open pollinated varieties. These are the laws we are fighting now. India 2004, Europe two years ago. The European parliamentarians called me in to help understand this law. And we wrote the critique. And then they asked for 1,200 amendments. Um, Colombia, in the United States, little, little seed libraries where people bring their seeds because the awareness of seed is growing so much. People bring little packages of seed, put it in a library so that someone else can take it like you take a book. They are being called agri-terrorism centers. Notices are being sent to them. And there's a California law making it illegal to exchange seed. So the corporations are very desperate because they have set total monopoly control as their objective. And every passing year, their Ponzi scheme becomes more obvious to more people. And I don't think they're going to get where they will. I think people will reclaim the freedom of seed. The freedom of seed itself to evolve, adapt, be diverse, and the freedom of farmers to save seeds, and the freedom of eaters to have diversity in their food from diversity of seed. All of that is what we talk about as seed freedom. Is the empowerment of local food producers and the rise of accessible seed banks around the world going to change the paradigm? How is that playing out in India? Yeah, I really do believe that this project of industrial agriculture, GMOs, more poisons in our food, more long distance trade in food, is doomed to fail. Every indicator is there. 75% of the planetary ecological destruction because of this model. You let it grow a little more, we have a dead planet. 75% diseases are now food related. So between the health of the planet and health of people, there's such a squeeze that people are turning, whether for health reasons, ecological reasons, or farmer survival reasons. In these 30 years, we have helped train nearly a million farmers to go organic and save seeds. We've set up 120 community seed banks, so seed can be reclaimed as a commons. Some of these seed banks have helped farmers come out of a drought. My most important memories are when after the super cyclone of Orissa in 1999, the little seeds of salt tolerant rices we had saved became the basis of rejuvenating agriculture. And then when the tsunami of 2004 hit Tamil Nadu, the farmers of Orissa could give two truckloads of salt tolerant seeds. The government had given up and said, five years we can't grow food because there's too much salt on the land. And we said, no, we can, and we'll bring the seeds. Um, so these seed banks are not museums. Uh, they're not to look at. They are actually the seeds of another agriculture in the areas of cotton, because the Bt cotton is the big crisis of India, which has pushed most of the 300,000 farmers who've committed suicide to suicide. 95% um, of the cotton seed is now owned and controlled by Monsanto through these cooked up royalty regimes and uh, patent. So massive increases in the price of the seed. I'll give you an example. Seed used to cost five rupees a kilo, at best 10 rupees a kilo. Monsanto came into the picture, 1,600 for a 450 gram packet, which means about 4,000 rupees a kilogram. Of the 1,600, 1,200 is their royalty. Just imagine. These are the cases we've had to fight over the years, and now the government is recognizing 
that something is very, very wrong. But we went and searched and searched and searched for old cotton varieties. Now here we have a seed bank for native cotton. And uh, we grow organic cotton. We work with the old Gandhi ashrams to spin hand-woven, hand-spun uh, cloth. And we call this fibers of freedom. So, uh, that, and, and most important is when farmers started to save seeds, they're the ones who put pressure on us. So we are now growing all this diversity. And yet the markets have been destroyed. And you've got to help us. So we literally started from scratch to build a domestic organic market based on fair trade. And uh, we facilitate bringing farmers organic and biodiverse produce. We are unlike most organic uh, initiatives, which only are organic tea or just organic coffee or just organic this. Or, we basically say a farmer must grow all, as much diversity as they can. And our studies are showing that the more you have diversity, the more nutrition you have. We measure nutrition per acre. And we can feed two times the population of the planet if we based our work on biodiversity. But people must eat diversity because all of our cells need that diversity. The bacteria in our gut of the 600 trillion, we are just a minority. We are bacteria. They need food. They need healthy food. They don't need glyphosate, which will kill them, because they have a shikimate pathway. I understand that uh, the Navdanya program means nine crops. What is that reference about? Okay, so when I started to save seeds, the Navdanya word wasn't even in my vocabulary. I called it the seed saving movement. I wasn't going to call it the genetic resources movement because going to a village and talking genetic resources, you have to end up talking about atoms in the plant, and that's a wrong paradigm. So I was doing a seed saving trip in South India, in the area where that bandit uh, Virappan uh, was controlling the sandalwood smuggling. And because of his fierceness, nobody went in that area. So no extension agency, no green revolution, no chemicals, lots of diversity. And this tribal was growing nine crops in his field. And I counted because, you know, I've done so many studies now about monocultures versus polycultures. And I said, wow, you're growing nine crops. And he said, yes, Nathania. I said, you say it so casually. Uh, and he said, you know, the nine planets, the nine crops in my field, and the balance in my bodies is one continuum. And I have a duty to maintain this balance. That's why I must grow diversity. I said, seed saving. Navdanya. But Navdanya has a dual meaning to it. Navdanya as grain means the nine grains. But Nav can also mean new and Dan can also mean gift. So it's also the new gift of reclaiming the commons in this context of privatization. Now each region would have a different nine, but it'll be a balance of cereals, pulses and oil seeds. How do you view the importance of Dr. Carrie Fowler's Svalbard Global Seed Bank? Well, you know, Carrie and I are among those who started way back then in the 80s, and Pat Mooney. Uh, Carrie originally was an activist like us, then he went to the FAO. Uh, now, of course, he's in Norway and the Svalbard. Uh, I believe that the real security in periods of climate change is to ha conserve living seed banks. And that because when you recognize that plants have intelligence and they adapt and they evolve, then you've got to give them the maximum scope for adaptation. Rather than keeping them in the fridge. It, right, yeah, and it, I really do believe. Also, because breeding is a very tedious subject. Now, you have it all locked up in Norway, and the disaster is somewhere far away. By the time you get that one package of seed out and turn it into a seed supply for a region that needs it, realistically, it doesn't fit as seed, but it fits as mining. Because we are living in an extractive world, not just the extraction of coal and oil, but the extraction of genes. And seeds are being defined as genetic mines. 
the data of this material is what corporations are seeking. And from a little bag they can get it. I, one of the big issues that I'm dealing with is the fact that the same corporations are claiming they have invented climate resilient. They haven't. They've taken climate resilient seeds and done the genomic reading. And uh, sadly, like the colonizers came to this continent and could prepare the maps and said this continent is ours or Columbus landed in America. Um, there is this assumption that if you can do a genomic map, you can treat it as an invention and a right to patent. That's what the companies can do. But to supply seeds from one place to the rest of the world in all its diversity is not a very feasible task. We do this work, we know what it takes. I think everywhere we should be growing diversity, not just saving seeds as a museum or as a disaster zone rescue place. We need the seeds in our fields to do the agroecological work. We need the seeds in our fields to do the evolutionary breeding that the seeds do in order to deal with climate change. So there are many pieces of the seed landscape that the Svalbard Bank loses out on. But it's good, it's waking people up to the fact that we must save seeds. Fowler says that it's a bank that he hopes will never need a withdrawal. And while it's run to professional standards, he also says that the future of biodiversity rests with the amateurs. So what he means by that is the growers, the seed savers, and the grassroots movements. Do you agree with him on that? Except that I would call us amateurs. I would call us the people who really care. I think this idea of experts versus amateurs is nonsense. I think what he means, Dr. Shiva, is by the term amateurs, it's not uh, the major agribusiness. Well, they were the illiterates in seed. Agribusiness, the Monsantos have never dealt in seed. They dealt in poisons and chemicals that kill. And then they dealt with genetic engineering, also stolen, or collaborations. But seed is not their expertise. Seed is not their domain. Given the 90% loss of biodiversity, is there enough genetic diversity left in the world for food security to be assured? Also, given the other risks of climate change and new viruses, can we return to the wild parents and land races as a source of varieties for the future? Well, I think there are two sources of varieties. One, those in the wilderness. But sadly, so many areas which have the rich diversity in the wild are conflict zones where this diversity is being devastated very fast. The second is the cultivated diversity, and farmers have increased diversity through breeding. Indian farmers took one grass and turned it into more than 100,000 varieties of rice. We've been able to rescue 4,000 of them. So I, I would not say, do we have enough diversity? because it is not a mathematical calculation. It is an ethical issue. With whatever biodiversity remains on the planet, we have a duty to protect it. We have a duty to grow it. We have a duty to learn more about it. We have a duty to get out of the careless technologies of industrial farming and enter into the caring technologies of agroecology. Can gene editing help develop better crops and ones that survive and thrive through organic techniques rather than using chemicals and pesticides? Well, the big debate is this. Is genetic engineering only adding a gene or editing a gene also? Now, if you treat a plant as an intelligent self-organized system, which is what the best of science today tells us it is, then the self-organization and self-regulating processes in the plant are hooked to its whole genomic structure. It's not an arbitrary pattern. That's why when you add a gene that doesn't belong to the plant, it disrupts that self-organization. Or you edit a gene, it also disrupts the self-organization. I think it's time to move away from the mechanistic idea of substantial equivalence and particles, etc., and move into the recognition of life as a self-organized complexity. This is what every top evolutionary biologist has taught me. 
And because of that, gene editing must be brought under the rubric of genetic engineering. And the plant as a whole, with human beings as a whole, working in co-creation are our best guarantee to deal with climate change and improve quality for a changing world. What's happening in the villages that you're seeing today in India? Well, you know, the villages that have been devastated. Uh, you will be reading about trains carrying water to Latour in Maratwar. Now, this is the area where in 1972 the World Bank said, oh, you have a drought, grow sugarcane, and made farmers grow sugarcane, which led to the creation of sugar barons, and sugarcane extracted 20 years' worth of recharge water from the ground. Now, for the last decade, Monsanto has pushed his BT cotton hybrid cottons, which is failing, failing to control pests, failing because it's not meant for a drought area. And there's devastation. Farmers are in despair, there's suicides, empty wells, dead soils. But we also work in villages. And where we are, the fields are full, a drought does not knock out your crop. People are not desperate because they're not living under the burden of debt. They're earning 10 times more by not wasting their money on toxic chemicals and GMO seeds, and they're getting higher incomes for what they sell, not by growing commodities, but by growing food for themselves and their neighbors. And these relationships, these direct relationships, is changing the economy. So we have the two worlds right with us in India. The world of destruction, devastation, and dead end, you know, that is the world that John Vidal says, 20 years and it's over. And there's the other world that continues the 10,000 trajectory, not in static motion, but in absolute dynamic evolution. And being part of an intelligent dynamic evolution is what we as human beings must realize. We've got to get out of this sense of seeds as machines which you are putting together somehow and inventing and you as masters and conquerors. That was the problem with killing people in the concentration camps. It's the problem with killing the planet and our farmers. And that's the problem we can solve and must. Lastly, what is happening with the environment of the third greatest water storehouse in the world, sometimes called the Third Pole? And by that, I mean Alpine Tibet. Oh, I wish I knew in depth, but uh, all I know is Tibet is being turned into a massive mine, mining zone, and colonized in the worst kind of way, where the typical things that happen when colonizers come in, destruction of culture, destruction of faith, and one of the most beautiful regions from where we have teachings for the future of humanity. I mean, His Holiness always says, that we saved the teachings of the soul of India in Tibet. Now it's time for us to give it back. I think he was referring specifically to water. Oh, water, though, the three problems with the issue of water in Tibet. The first is so much of it is permafrost, and with climate change, that's melting. And uh, second is most of our major rivers for the subcontinent of South Asia emerge from the Tibetan plateau, whether it be westwards the Indus or eastwards the Bra Brahmaputra. And there's this big turn that the Brahmaputra takes, and the Chinese call it Sangpo. They want to take the water northwards to the dry areas because their appetite for water doesn't stop because if you're a global factory and you have to keep building bigger and bigger and bigger mega cities, you need lots and lots and lots of water. And that would mean major conflicts. It would also mean rivers going dry. And there have been cases where India has had to tell China, stop building these dams. Dr. Shiva, thank you very much for your time today. You're welcome. Really